If you've been playing translated visual novels in Edoge for a while, then chances are you're familiar with quite a few big names. Ki, Alasoft, Type Moon, Nitro Plus, Giga, and so on and so on. And for good reason. Those are all good studios who have had some of their finest works translated into English, even if imperfectly sometimes, to reach an audience far wider than they otherwise would. But as a lot of people who play only in English likely know, the world of VNs is far wider than just what gets translated. And there's a whole universe of both smaller studios and solo devs crafting titles for sites like DL site and conventions like Comiquet, and important developers like Elf and Naval that are still mostly unknown outside of their home country. And for our purposes today, there's one particularly unique developer whose greatest works have eluded the English-speaking Edoge scene for a very long time. Black Psych is a brand spawned out of Psych, one of many early 2000s studios crafting solid but not famous titles, worth your time but not written into Edoge canon, so to speak. Forming less than a year after Psych, however, this brand strayed away from their parents' lovey bishoujo gay products into something distinctly different, brooding, dark tales, often with a horrific and or extreme slant. Throughout the years, they've crafted a number of creative, well-received, or at the very least, interesting games. Minded Blood, Gun Katana, Extravaganza, Mugen Kaido, and of course, the very recently translated Gore Screaming Show, the second title of theirs to make it into English after the far more extreme sadistic blood in late 2020, and one that's long been hyped up by the Japanese reading Edoge community. What makes all of this even more interesting than just the cool premises, like Gun Katana being Wolfenstein 3D meets Otome Games meets a Hot Topic store, or Extravaganza being about motherhood, is how shockingly progressive and feminist many of these games are, with some choice titles in playing women as lead writers, and in general, being unafraid to tackle concepts you might not expect like sexual liberation, queer identities, and so on. It's also important to note that even if you aren't familiar with Psych and Black Psych themselves, it is possible you've played or heard about a game by the related Psychlet brand, responsible most notably for Dasaku, which I've been told to play more times than I can count, and I promise I'll get to eventually. So before I dive headfirst in the Gore Screaming show for my next video, and because I've worked myself half to death in November trying to cram out music for games alongside this video to get income, I'd like to take everyone along for a short dive into a very gay, very queer, and very unique game that marks the first title this incredible brand of depravity, empowerment, and disgusting horror gave to the world, Yami no Koe, The Voice in the Night. Released in the middle of 2001 exclusively for Windows computers, Yami no Koe is one of the most unique Edoge I've played, and one of the two Nuki Gays so far that have held my interest for more than a couple minutes. Actually, I don't even know if calling it that is correct. I feel like it's misleading because only about half of the game is an unadulterated sex fest for people to come to their darkest desires. The other half is a shipping simulator to make that sex fest happen, where you quote unquote corrupt people to appease an eldritch creature that just wants to see people fucking be happy. See, underneath this veneer of a schlocky B movie horror corruption game, where young adults get stranded on an island to succumb to pleasures as one woman stands alone in trying to solve the mysteries of the land, are themes about self-acceptance, sexual liberation, and freedom, and spins on the nature of corruption and horror as genres, and a very unique and enticing gameplay system where you get to play as the villain underlying it all. Is it perfect? In the spirit of the B-movies it feels so inspired by, not exactly. The game is limited by its small scope, the odd questionable trope, and somewhat predictable twists, relying entirely on its charm in the moment-to-moment frills to get by. But if those weren't as strong as they are, then I wouldn't be so excited to talk about the game and I wouldn't be making this video. So without further ado, let's dive into the title that launches creative, grotesque, and inspiring brand onto the stage and pave the path for many incredible games in the future. Yami no Koe is set in then-contemporary Japan and follows a group of six people exploring the vast wide oceans of Japan on a yacht, looking to take a break from the monotony of the high school student and teaching life. Two of them are teachers, the strict Kubo Shinjiro and the kind Sahara Kimie, and the other four are a group of close-knit friends, the jock Tsuchiya Goya, the nervous Koizumi Huyuki, the social glue Mizunu Arisu, and the shy Yashiro Moe. What starts as a fun trip, however, soon turns to disaster. After a stowaway by the name of Tachikawa Nanami reveals herself and starts causing friction with the group, a storm strikes and forces everybody to make an emergency docking on the only nearby place. A mysterious, unknown island of a massive mansion, headed by the alluring Sayoko, her right-hand maid Kei, and the enigmatic voice in the night the group is yet unaware of. Sayoko offers a stranded group shelter until the next monthly supply boat arrives, but something about it seems all wrong. Little does the group group know that the mistress of the mansion isn't a friendly and caring host, but something far darker, a being beyond
beyond humans and in touch with powerful forces, something that Nanami seems to know about. The severe isolation of the island, mysterious rooms filled with bizarre objects, and the reason Sayako slowly leads the original group of six into depravity and corruption are all mysteries that only Nanami can hope to solve as her and the group's chances of making it through all 30 days until the next supply boat grow slimmer with each passing hour. And if she fails, there may be a fate worse than death awaiting them. Yami no Koei's setup is some classic budget horror at its finest. A group of friends who get along imperfectly stranded together in the middle of nowhere of a big ol' spooky mansion, suspiciously cut off from the rest of society with no telephones or other outside communications, and a mysterious figure guiding everyone through the event that serves as our antagonist. All of the basics are executed super well, from the cliched but entertaining opening of the dramatic title drop that establishes the whole casting crew in under 15 minutes, to the intriguing open ending of a cool if slightly predictable twist, the story manages to capture the same energy as watching some random flick on late night cable TV. The particular strengths of Yami no Koei lie not in the main story, but in the characters and how they're each developed. Each of them are very average and typical people, but from the very start the writing establishes their flaws and strengths, and then spends the rest of the runtime expanding on and playing with those through some very unconventional means. I'll talk more about the gameplay shortly, but to give a quick comparison, it functions something like a roguelike without the randomization or in-game benefits for doing a run. Since the emphasis here is on individual character stories and interactions, and getting as many of those as you can, you're intended to play over and over again to learn the mechanics and see new scenes, optimizing your playthroughs more and more each time, while well, the main story thread that occurs regardless of what you do mostly works as a background force to keep intrigue and suspense high. That's not to say it's bad or underdeveloped in any way, though. Your first run will likely take you anywhere from around 1 to 2 hours and has somewhere around 15 to 20 minutes of main story, carefully sprinkled throughout to be engaging while all the character interactions are happening. And as you're unlikely to clear the game on your first run, everything you see just serves as a hook to keep coming back to solve the mystery of the mansion in Sayoko. After my initial playthrough, I found my subsequent runs took about 30 minutes to an hour with skipping repeat dialogue, which made the game easy to binge and sink time into without even realizing it. I sat down for four hours straight, first run to last, until I finally saw the true ending, at which point I realized I had still only seen a fraction of what the game had to offer. 100%ing this can take anywhere from around 8-10 to 10 hours with an average reading speed, and that time feels like it goes by in an instant. It helps too that the writing for this game is very strong and easy to parse, almost to the point I would suggest this game if you're new to learning Japanese. There's very little use of prose, the dialogue doesn't utilize very complicated sentence structures, the actual vocabulary is simple and words can be easily figured out through context, and yet with all that there's still plenty of creativity and strong character voicing, particularly with our villain. Sayoko is without a doubt one of the strongest parts of this game and just a flatly memorable antagonist. Rather than being an outright malicious or cruel person, she's some weird cosmic creature that exists solely to make people feel good and let go of their inhibitions. Whether or not that's bad is at the core of this game's themes, as she does pretty much cut people off from the rest of society to accomplish this and let them achieve supreme pleasure, but she isn't a malicious or inherently harmful being. Hell, Nanami is arguably a lot worse than her. Sayoko, for all of her inhumanness, is kind and willing to entertain pretty much anyone and anything as long as they're feeling good, no matter what that might entail. But despite being billed basically as our heroine, Nanami is brash, insulting, cruel, secretive, and has zero desire to engage with anything but her own interest to solve the mysteries of the island, only being around the other six if they're of any use to her. I'll talk more about this in the spoiler segment, but despite the small amount of main story content here, there's still something going on with how this game toys with the ideas of hero and villain in a horror setting. On a base level, it makes for a fascinating dichotomy that the stranded six are stuck in the middle of. Do they abide by the kind, mysterious mistress, or do they trust the cold-hearted stowaway who seems to know something they don't? It makes for an atmosphere that's often tense and uncomfortable with the lines of good and bad being rather blurry, one furthered by the kink this game prides itself on. Yami no Koe is, by classification, a game about corruption. If you're not super familiar with it, then here's the basics. It's about taking somebody, typically someone pure and chaste, and driving them down an endless pit of lewd debauchery. Oftentimes in Edo Dojin and in Edo Gay, this is something that happens without the consent and without the desire of the person being corrupted. A characters forced into abandoning all moral pretenses in the favor of pleasure is usually what the appeal is. My apprehension to call Yami no Koe corruption in the same sense as a lot of other corruption media comes from one particular detail. Most of what happens is consensual, and everybody desires what happens to them. Arisu is constantly stressed trying to 
manage her friend group, Huyuki is at unease with her femininity, Moe is shy and lacks confidence, and so on and so on. All things that Sayako is able to point to and say, hey, you want to fuck around and let off some steam? And so Arisu is allowed to liberate herself and be a head empty cat girl for a while, Huyuki can transition and feel comfortable with her body, and Moe can be dressed up pretty and feel confident in her sexual capabilities rather than being scared, things they desire but aren't allowed in their day to day life for any variety of reasons. To put it simply, while this game is framed as a horror corruption title, the genre is really just that. Framing. It's not about seeing people fall from grace horrified at how low they've sank and deciding they have nothing but pleasure from there. It's about people being given a release from the confines of society and the pressures of life in a safe environment where they can be as kinky and weird as they want, even if they may struggle to accept it at first. There's nothing that Sayako plays on here that these people don't want to some extent. It's also through this supposed corruption that we're able to learn more about each character. As stated before, they're pretty boring people on the surface, with only a couple of cracks in their lives being visible from the get-go. By Sayako's exploiting of those, we get to learn more about them and form more complex pictures of who they are in a way that coincides with their sexual liberation, what they wish they could have, what troubles them, etc. I do want to clarify that if I've given the impression this game has some grandiose commentary on the nature of human desire and how societal norms force us into being neutered versions of ourselves, that's something I would love to see and hope other games explore, but it's not exactly what's present here. But the game is certainly aware of these concepts of liberation and weaves them into the plot and into the gameplay. The basic goal is to push each character through the stages of corruption, starting with their normal selves and ending with them completely embracing some repressed aspect of their personhood. If they're not sufficiently corrupted by a certain point in your playthrough, they'll escape the mansion, and without everybody fully corrupted by the end, Nanami will find her way out on the last day. To achieve this, you need to pair characters together at the start of each day, and since nobody starts out wanting to bang each other, you're initially limited to sending Sayoko and Kei around to build some tensions. And once you hit the go button, everything you have and have not sent into action will play out and the next day will begin. Once enough has happened to someone and they reach the first stage of corruption, then you can start shipping them with others, with increasing levels of compatibility the further they go. There are two caveats to this, however. One, pretty much everything costs energy and so you only have so much per day to spend. Everybody except Sayoko and Kei has a use and place cost associated with them initially. An uncorrupted person costs 2 energy to target, a character in stage 1 costs 1 energy to use or target, and in stages 2 or 3 they're totally free. For the first couple of in-game days this isn't a problem, but once you have one or two people ready to cause some havoc, you have to start getting strategic about how much energy you're expending and where because of the second caveat. Not every ship is good from the get-go, or at all. Moe, for example, starts out incredibly uncomfortable with masculine people, and so any interactions between her and Golia result in nothing for the two of them. Them until she's past a certain point. Some ships might just be passable and have minimal benefits for both people, which makes them non-optimal. And others are great. Sayoko and Kei, for instance, tend to work with just about everybody, and are good go-tos if you're unsure of what to do next. This game is deceptively simple because of this. While the base mechanic of sticking people together never gets any more complicated, the sheer number of pairings and the way they alter through stages of corruption means there's a ton to keep in mind in order to build a successful playthrough. If you're inefficient and waste too many days, then at worst, people besides Nanami will escape the Maniac Mansion, and at best you'll fail to get everyone to the final stage and Nanami will still escape. This is not to say this game is only meant for elite gamers or something, I was able to finish my first true end run with 4 turns to spare, but you still can't mess up too much without needing to save and load. So the way to success is to learn what each character desires, because again, this isn't a title about forcing people into things, it's about giving them an environment to discover, accept, and enjoy desires they couldn't otherwise. If you ship two people together who are mismatched, then they'll either give some words of encouragement and subtle player advice or scoff at each other. Some characters might not even need pairings to accomplish anything, they'll just indulge themselves and naturally corrupt over time. Once you've figured that out, you can start plotting out how to achieve a domino effect. Pairing Sayoko and Kei up effectively to begin corrupting one or two useful people, and then using them with compatible characters to corrupt more, until the mansion is just one big orgy and Nanami can no longer leave. While you're mostly on your own to figure out all of this, the game does at least provide a minor aid in the form of the scene gallery, where you can see who actually has interactions with who, and track your overall completion percentage. The gameplay here is kind of addicting once you understand the basics of it. Because of how simple the mechanics are and how short runs tend to be, it's easy to start up a run and end up with hours flying by as you try different strategies and attempt to learn who pairs well with who, and finding new content both on purpose and by complete accident. The only even vaguely complicated part of the mechanics is the way that each character has two 
two potential forms that play on different aspects of their personality, red and blue. You could have Arisu forgo all of her social responsibility to become a docile cat girl, or you could let her become even more controlling and turn into a BDSM mistress. It adds some extra variety and spice to the game for sure, but it does compound what I think is the main problem with the gameplay. It can just be trial and error. While I love how the gameplay is all about learning character personalities and chemistries, there were a few times where I felt like I was just blindly sticking people together in hopes that something would happen because I couldn't figure it out otherwise. It's not a major problem, and I'm admittedly not great at puzzles, so it might just be a me thing, but if you want 100% the game, then don't be surprised if you hit a wall. On the plus side, multiple forms does mean a lot more sluttery, and this game has quite a bit of content. There's a whole gamut of attractions and kinks played with here, plain old hetero banging, buy free some sloppy lesbian shags, pre-transition trans girls with dominant women, cock and ball torture, wax play, self-pleasuring, and all with a very fruity tint to it. It doesn't represent every part of the queer spectrum, but it sure as hell does a lot, especially for 2001. I don't know anything about the orientation or gender of this game's writer-director, Mabadoshi Sakuya, and I'm not gonna speculate because if they want to keep that private, it ain't my place to dig around. But at the very least, they have a keen eye for how to create strong queer imagery and dialogue, particularly with the emphasis on oft-exaggerated feminine beauty. The mouse cursor is a finely beautified hand, there's a regular CG showcasing gorgeously painted nails, characters are put into drag-like makeup, and to top it all off, a grand majority of the content in the game is in some way either gay or diverts away from normal heterosex. While a lot of the content here isn't really my thing, I can still admire the diversity of it, the quality of the writing, and the illustrations. It's a game that feels like it's written to appeal to a lot more than just a straight male audience, with an emphasis on how the women are feeling and often letting them guide the action, or simply allowing the player to be a voyeur to some people fucking around in a lewd way, but not necessarily with intercourse, which I always welcome. Also, Style Cole can just do magic SRS to one of the characters, Huyuki, just straight up trans her gender in a game from 2001, and she's handled really well. Well, mostly. The same goes for a lot of this content, really. The game generally avoids being homophobic or stereotypical, and instead just has a blast of all sorts of subdom dynamics, gender play, toys, bondage, all in the service of exploring pleasures in a safe place. The only thing I'd really say I'm not fond of is the framing of one of Huyuki's paths, and it's the easier one to achieve at that, where she cross-dresses and finds it erotic, with the pleasure they fall into being deemed narcissism? It creates a weird dichotomy, because on one hand, you have the route where she's openly a trans woman, far happier for it, and handled respectfully, and on the other, you have this thing that reeks of old garbage theories that every trans person is just horny of a narcissistic disorder, which isn't even an invalidating thing to begin with, but it's framed as being completely opposite to transness. Given how well the other path is handled, I doubt Sakuya intended there to be anything transphobic in the game, and probably just thought of it as some kinky gender play, and hey, if you're into this, that's fine, more power to you, but I can imagine this rubbing some players the wrong way. And if what you're after is gender play anyways, then the trans path has a lot of it and really well done at that, being affirmative of her identity while still having a bit of consensual fun. All of this is avoiding the elephant in the room, however. Nanami, the pure, chaste virginal girl, the one who you cannot do anything to for the bulk of the game, and the one who would theoretically serve the role of the final girl where that's a typical horror game or film. Even if everybody else stays on the island, she can still escape and actively works to solve the mystery while the rest of the cast gets picked off. So just what does the game do with this setup, and how do these various themes the game has going around conclude? From here on to a certain point in the video, I'll be getting into spoilers. It doesn't matter too much, I think, since the fun is more in the moment-to-moment -moment events, but the game is short if you want to go in without knowing all the big payoffs. But before you skip, if you do, using the timecode on screen, I would like to take a moment to shout out the cool patrons who support my content, some VN news, and channels I think you might like. Well, hey, I think I'm finally back on schedule, mostly. Like I mentioned in the intro of this video, I spent a lot of time in November hacking away at game music for income, and by some stroke of luck, this video ended up being a breeze to produce. I'm sorry if the shorter than usual length is a bit of a disappointment, but I did really need to get something less strenuous out this month since I know the next video will be a doozy, and I really just wanted to get back on track since I was feeling bad that I kept delaying videos. Still, I'm happy with how this turned out, and it wouldn't be possible for me to make videos of this length or the big ol' long ones I usually do if it weren't for my patrons. Things are still stable at almost 600 per month, which combined with some music income and some careful budgeting means I'll be safe and stable for a while now. My hope is that I'll be able to focus on this full time at some point, though I'm guessing it'll be a while before I start making 1.2k before taxes and fees and such. That seems to be about the minimum I need to make to be completely stable. This is not to say I'm not incredibly grateful for the ridiculous amount I'm able to make off of this right now. I have nothing but the biggest thank yous, as always, to everyone who makes this possible. All of you whose names are scrolling on the screen, you're the best. You keep me housed and fed and able to make these silly old rambly things about obscure games, so... 
thank you. It means the world to me. I'm going to keep the shout out to news updates short here since this video is already on the shorter side and I don't want to inflate the length of it by using this section, and focus primarily on some English language original releases. Ibihime just put out another title, Sweetest Monster Refrain, which, to quote their description, features an exceedingly dysfunctional relationship between a depressed music teacher and a cute question mark cat girl who just wants to make him happy. If you ask me, that sounds fantastic! While I haven't gotten around to playing their works, I've always been impressed by the quality of art and music and snippets of the writing I've seen, and this looks no different, so please support them if you're able. This one was not able to make it on Steam for bullshit mysterious reasons, and it really does not deserve to fail because of it. I can't stress how important it is that if you're a fan of visual novels and eroge, that you need to keep your eyes out and publish your web pages, discords, and itch.io links, mostly because a lot of titles that are great don't get on Steam because of these nonsense guidelines. So support people like Abihimi if you can, and larger developers like Jazz and Manga Gamer because they too get hit by this garbage. The other title I want to shout out is Queen Beast, a free fantasy title inspired by Alice Soft and Leaf Games with utterly gorgeous art and a fascinating premise. I'm planning to play this one basically as soon as this video is out, and I hope at least a few of you do too and show support for the creators, as unfortunately, while this one did make it to Steam, it's stuck in the adults only section, which completely tanks accessibility. Again, just to emphasize things, please support quality English language VN releases if you can because platforms like Steam are absurdly hostile to them. And titles like Queen Beasts and Sweetest Monster Refrain and all the others that don't get the light of day on the platform deserve attention and fans as much as any other game. And finally, some quick Patreon questions. Victoria Vila asked, will you still be making a video on tactics, specifically One in Moon? Also, do you intend on doing videos on Shizuku Sayonara Oshiete? Yes, yes, and yes, I actually recently got a copy of Moon for the purpose of making a video on it, and I talk about it later in this video, but I really want to talk about Shizuku. Ify asked, any plans on making a video on the Chunsoft sound novels, or even older games like Portopia? I definitely want to talk about Chunsoft sound novels, but I'm not sure if I'd have a ton to say on very old games like Portopia. It is for sure on my list of things to look into, though, and titles like Otogodiso are definitely on my list of things to cover. And finally, from Breaker Railgun, is there a visual novel, or if you would like to, you can mention movies, series, documentary, that you fundamentally disagree with the perspective of the main topic? I know I've definitely read, played, and watched some specific titles that I found massively disagreeable, but I've been trying to figure an exact answer to this post since I saw the comment posted. I guess I can just throw a blanket answer of any media that promotes imperialism, militarism, fundamentalism, etc. I'd try to be open with what media I consume, but if you're ultimately just going to be promoting colonialism as a good or sexism as just or whatever, then you can miss me with that shit. That's all for this time, and again, thank you to everyone who supports this channel. It seriously means a ton to me, and I hope I can keep providing good content for y'all to watch. I know it's not always perfect, I'm kind of embarrassed I spaced out on talking about historical fiction in my last video, for instance. I'm actually really embarrassed about that one. But I just hope what I make is at least entertaining and can keep making an impact on some of you. It seriously means the world to me to see people saying my videos inspired them or made them happier or just any nice things like that, so thank you again, and if you want to have your name scrolling on the screen like all these cool people, then consider donating anything monthly, a dollar, ten dollars, hundred dollars, literally anything helps and means a lot. Or you can do a one-time via Ko-fi if you don't want to do monthly on Patreon. Anything works, even just liking, shouting out, subscribing, all that stuff. So again, uh, th th this is a fucking ramble, but thank you, and back to the show. So, throughout each playthrough of the game, Nanami will be running around the mansion, dropping various plot details on characters, and hinting at deep, dark secrets abound the place. You won't get to see all of these on a single run, but through the magic of having played the game all the way through and having seen most of the content, I can drop all the sick lore here. First off, Nanami is right that the island is not what it seems. According to her, it goes by the name Iejima, and the reason no one really knows about it is due both to its isolation from the rest of the world, and because it only surfaces a couple times every year, spending the rest of its time under the sea. Supposedly, any boat that comes near it is cursed to be shipwrecked, and she snuck on knowing that they'd end up stranded here somehow. Nanami is here for one thing, and one thing only. She wants to find her older brother, who supposedly went missing on the island, something that Sayoko knows about but won't let her in on, so it's up to her to figure out what the hell is happening by interrogating the rest of the cast and crew and examining the whole place. This leads to her stumbling into some mysterious BDSM dungeons, among other places, as well as finding a bizarre book. According to Kei, the mysterious maid who shares her name with Nanami's brother, the book is 
written in Aklo, which Lovecraft fans might be familiar with as a language used for spells in the Cthulhu mythos. This magic is presumably how she's able to sink the island on demand, as well as maybe cast some sort of general concealing aura around it, like it's a Klingon ship in Star Trek going stealth, mostly because I find it very hard to believe the Japanese government wouldn't notice an island constantly flickering in and out of existence. As for Sayako herself, the game never quite explains what her deal is, but there's a lot that can be surmised about her just from her powers. As far as I can tell, she's some sort of inhuman eldritch being that seeks to leave people into pleasure for her own amusement and to see people having a good time with no particular personal gains. To accomplish this, she's aided by the Voice in the Night, an ethereal being that communicates only with her and the other characters once they're fully corrupted, with it seeming to be subordinate to her. These elements all come together in a true ending of the game once the Stranded Six are corrupted and obey Sayako's will. The island sinks with Nanami in it, and Sayako shows her the fruits of her labor, inviting her to engage too, before the big twist is revealed. Her brother, the one who went missing years ago on this island, is the voice in the night or more specifically, when part of it. The creature is a being with multiple forms and agents, a ghost-like apparition taking a male form, a tentacle monster, and many others, including the Maid Kay. Upon realizing this and accepting the supreme pleasure of being a brocon, she too gives in and is transformed into another one of Sayako's loyal toys, and given a new body suited for experiencing limitless pleasure. It's a simple plot that straddles the line a bit close to just being an excuse to have a lot of porn in one place, which is fine, and the twist, while cool, is sort of predictable, but I do think what's here is worth trying to examine, particularly the way in which Nanami and Sayoko can be seen as representing two extremes of sexual expression. On one hand, Nanami holds conservative and restrictive views. She chastises those she views as perverted and seeks to turn her eyes away from a world of liberation in favor of one of normalcy. On the other hand, Sayoko leans full into wanting people to be liberated and facilitating that, giving them safe spaces to explore kinks, allowing clear identities to flourish, to the point that these people can no longer return to a society that denigrates and despises these, metaphorically and literally, as they become unable to escape the mansion. And is that so bad? If all that means to survive and live are secure, then is it wrong to want to live in a world where you're free to live out your days as you choose, in your own little cozy community of perverts who all get along, or at the very least accept each other? I'm not exactly trying to say Sayako is a hero here, or a sex-positive feminist icon, even though she goddamn should be. There's some things fucked up about what she does if you think about it. Everybody's families are probably worried about them, friends have no idea where they've gone, and Sayako's entire plot relies on having some mysterious consistent import of supplies, unless everyone wants to take a break from fucking, to do some agriculture or something, and build a sustainable small anarcho-communist community. But I don't think this game wants us to think about the economic viability and social structuring of a sex commune, nor debates about whether or not escapism in the form of running away from the world around you can be healthy or harmful, and it's certainly not what bothers Nanami about all this. What seems to bother her more than anything is that she sees any deviancy as disgusting and wrong. She's transphobic towards Huyuki, she despises Goya for no reason, she's disgusted by anyone doing anything lewd. In any other story, she would be a heroine that's fighting to preserve normalcy and defeat an evil, but here she's a regressive asshole who despises the abnormal. And definitely a closeted brocon. It's a really interesting twist on corruption and really on our expectations of horror to have simple villains and heroes. The start of the game has this really mysterious and uncomfortable atmosphere, being shipwrecked, unaware of what's truly going on, left on your own to figure out what's happening in this mysterious manner or hell, what even the goal of this game is. I thought it was going to be getting everybody to escape. But that stereotypical B-movie atmosphere slowly begins to unravel into these themes of sexual liberation. Sayoko transforms in the eyes of the player from a cruel manipulative villain to an amoral superstar, and the perspective of Nanami changes from that of a brave heroine attempting to solve a mystery to a bigot, seeking to serve only her own interests. Our villain is not seeking to distort these people because it's hot to make them into degenerates or whatever, she seeks to liberate people from the shackles of limiting concepts of sexuality and pleasure so they can explore parts of themselves they're ashamed of that they're told they cannot acknowledge or indulge in, and I think that's fascinating. While Yami no Koe is almost certainly limited by its scope, there is still a lot here that's interesting to explore, and I'm definitely curious to check out the sequels to see where the series goes. As far as I understand, the second title is pretty much just a straight improvement on this game, and the rest are mixed in quality, but that just makes them perfect for video essays. One aspect of the game I haven't really touched on yet, but ought to before I wrap things up, is the art as a whole. It was illustrated primarily by Ueda Matoa, who Black Psych fans might already be familiar with for his work on a number of their titles. 
being his first work with them, it is all a bit rough around the edges. Proportions in particular can sometimes feel very off in CGs, even if the character sprites are mostly fine and scenarios are erotic enough to make up for the occasional scrunkled arms. Still though, props gotta be given for what he does well, and there's a lot he does well here. Many of the angles in the CGs are fantastic, the facial expressions are great, and he's got a very unique style that makes this title stand out among others from the era in a good way. And speaking of things that stand out, you've probably noticed how different the backgrounds look from the characters in this video, and that's because they were handled by the other illustrator on the title, Kusakali Matsuri, who would later go on to write Gore Screaming Show while Meitalo served as the director. This wasn't her first work here, as she had worked with Psych before the Black Psych brand was created, but unlike with the prior two games she worked on, she went for fancy 3D pre-rendered backgrounds here. The results are, uh... Well, you can tell this game came out in 2001, and I fucking love it. Just look at that wall texture. This brick JPEG wall texture, and the unforgettable main hall of the mansion with aliasing artifacts everywhere. It it probably sounds like I'm ragging on this, but I honestly love it. It just adds to the off-kilter atmosphere of the whole thing in a way that could only happen in an era where this was still cutting edge. I also gotta shout out the UI in general, it's so very extra in every way, from the grey and red color scheming, the gratuitously lewd text borders, and the generally dreary edgy aesthetic that feels like an emo MySpace page from the mid-2000s, shit hits good, especially with the sound effects being shockingly crisp and distinct after all these years. I'd also argue the music has held up well too, even if it shows its age as much as the graphics. The game offers up its soundtrack in two forms, CD audio and general MIDI, with the former seeing to be higher quality arrangements of the latter. The actual compositions themselves are rather good, focusing primarily on orchestral tracks with moody classical riffs mixed with the occasional 90s digital synth tone. It is a bit small in size with only 12 tracks total, three of which you'll only be hearing once during gameplay, but as the game isn't very long, it never ends up being a problem like it does in, say, Jisatsu 101, where I wanted to mute the damn thing half the time. The only audio thing I have some real mixed feelings on is the voice acting. This was a first work for quite a few of the performers and an early work for others, and it definitely shows in some ways. Nothing is bad here per se, but you can feel the amateurishness with some characters, as well as audio quality being rough in general. I find it charming, but I can see it being a figurative and literal turnoff for some people, though thankfully you can just turn it off if you don't like it. So, at the end of the day, is it worth playing Yami no Koe? If it isn't already clear, yeah. Yeah, it is! While it is still a Nuki Gay at the end of the day, which I know isn't gonna vibe with some people who want purely story over sex, what themes are here are interesting, the character interactions are a lot of fun, the art is delightful, the music is a joy, the gameplay is simple, creative, and addicting, and most importantly for its genre, it can be pretty hot. If you want to pick up the title, the game can be found for sale on DMM, though unfortunately it's priced a bit high for a short and old title at over 3,000 yen, so I would advise waiting for a sale or just picking it up secondhand since the game doesn't command much of a premium on the secondhand market. It's a good title, but maybe more something like 1,500 yen. As a first title for a new brand, however, I think it's an incredible first outing. It's fine queer horror and erotica that rejects boring heteronormativity in favor of fucking around and finding out, kept short, sweet, and easy to read with great pacing and a fun premise. Given how Black Psych is still around to this day, even after a couple years break, it seems I'm not the only one who likes this game a lot. I'm excited to dig into more of their titles next year, especially Gun Katana, given that retro FPS games used to be my jam and I still enjoy checking them out from time to time, but this game also has me interested in horror, erage, and darker titles in general, like the surprisingly anti-capitalist Dead in Aegis, the OG Dempa game Shizuku, or the influential Otogiriso, and maybe I'll even take a look at the rest of the series someday soon. Happy holidays, y'all! See you next year.